I, I love reading this piece of scripture, Luke 15. It's one of my favorites. In fact, if I was to say, what's my favorite parable in the New Testament that Jesus tells, I might turn to Luke 15. It's one of those parables that every time I go to it, I kind of picture something new. And, and if you're in church, you're new to church, uh, or excuse me, if you're not new to church, you've probably heard this one before. Or maybe even if you're new to church, you may have seen the Rembrandt painting of the prodigal son, where it's been out there, where this, this story has been memorialized in so many ways. So no matter if you're kind of new to church, if you're here and, and this is a new thing for you, or you're not new to church, this is probably a story you've heard before. And maybe you haven't heard all three of these parables together, but this is the lost chapter in the Bible. Chapter 15 of Luke is the lost chapter, and it's one of those things that I love. And so, what is he saying this? What is Jesus really saying? And I think to set this up, I almost have to ruin a current movie for you, all right? So let me ruin this movie for you if you haven't seen it yet, but it's not a new movie, so I don't feel that bad, all right? In fact, since 1976, audiences around the world have watched a drama unfold on stage, and most recently in this movie called Les Miserables Bulls, right? <laughs> That's what it is. Hopefully you know this was originally a novel. It was written by a man named Victor Hugo. I read it as part of a Western civilization class that I took when I was a sophomore in college. Great story. A story of a man named Jean Valjean who was a French prisoner sentenced to a 19-year term of hard labor for, cr for the crime of stealing bread. That's what he did, and he was, he was thrown in prison for doing this. And his time in prison gradually caused Valjean to become a hardened and fast and furious criminal. Is what he was. I just referenced another movie. Did you hear that? That was, a, that was a complete mistake. That was great. I noticed that as I was talking. I'm done. I should stop. All right. Um, but he became a really hardened criminal while he was there in his 19 years of prison. And so by the time he got out, he became a real, real kind of man who was tough. He was strong. He'd beat anyone in a f fist fight that he wanted to. But eventually he got out. He earned his release. And the amazing thing is in that day in France, the day that it was talking about, convicts had to carry papers with them to say that they were a felon. And so when Valjean gets out of prison, he wanders through the streets of France trying to find a place to, to be. But he, no one would take him. No one would employ him because he had these papers. And they were a mark. They were an identity that he could not get past, unfortunately. Until one day he ran into a bishop. And this bishop, who lived with his sister, invited him to come and stay at their house. And, and Jean Valjean goes in there, stays in the house that night. And if you know this story or not, that night while the bishop and his sister are sleeping, Valjean decides to steal the silver out of the house, the silverware in the house there. And so grabs all the silverware and takes it and runs. Well, the next morning, the, uh, the dawn awakens, if you will, and, and uh, Valjean is rushed back by police that have found him to the bishop's house, knocks on the door, and the bishop sees him standing there and sees Valjean standing and says, we found this man, he stole your silver. And, uh, and so the, the bishop, in a way that no one would have expected him to, responds by saying these words. So there you are. I'm so delighted to see you. Had you forgotten that I gave you candlesticks as well? They're silver, just like the rest, and they're worth a good 200 francs. Did you forget to take these with you? In this moment of pure, utter amazement, Valjean's mouth hung open, and, and the old man assured the police that this gift was, this, this silver was a gift to Valjean to help him on his new life. And the police leave in dumbfounded nature, and the, and the, and the bishop says to Valjean, says to him, do not forget, do not ever forget that now you have promised to use the money that I'm giving you to make yourself an honest man. Now, this power of this bishop's act went against all human sensibility that would want retribution or revenge of some sort. And these silver candlesticks became a memento of grace that throughout the story Valjean kept as a way of saying, I'm new now, I'm different. And he kept these things till the end of his life. Hugo's novel, interestingly enough, goes to this two-sided parable. I always refer to the novel. I haven't seen the movie yet. So um, it goes to this two-sided parable of grace, forgiveness, and law, interestingly enough, because what happens next is there's a man whose name is Javert, Inspector Javert, who, who becomes a man who is consumed with law, finds out that Valjean has actually changed his identity forged his paper and is trying to live a new life. And Yaver figures this out. He goes after him, understands that he wants to get him and, and, and make sure he is held accountable for the unrighteous deed that he had done. And so Yaver, you see this story of Yaver just dealing with Valjean and trying to chase after him, relentlessly pursuing him for years and years. 
And as Valjean is continually transformed by this grace that was offered to him by the bishop, the story comes to a climax when Valjean actually saves Inspector Javert's life in this moment of pure and craziness in the movie, in the, in the book, if you will. And all of a sudden, Javert can't handle it. He can't handle what happened. He can't justify what happened there. And why would this man, who I have been pursuing relentlessly for years and years, why would he save my life? Why would he go about that? Unable to cope with that idea of grace, and and it went against his instinct, and finding no corresponding forgiveness, Yaver jumps off the river to the Sign River to his death. It's an amazing story. Now, if you're a man in here, and you're like, I really don't want to see this movie. I fixed it for you, all right? I just helped you. You got it all down. So it's a story of grace against every instinct in the modern world. So and it's an amazing thing. It's one of those things where we feel the tension because Yaver is not supposed to be the bad guy in this story. He's the lawman. He's a policeman. He's the one who holds the law righteously. He's not supposed to be the bad guy. And yet we find ourselves rooting against him while we're reading this, while we're watching this, whatever it is. We find ourselves not wanting wanting Valjean to get caught. We don't want that to happen. And we fight against that that whole time. And and it's really interesting because when Yaber can't justify his own life with the things that are happening around him, he can't handle it. He commits suicide, kills himself. And the interesting thing about this is that keeping the law for Yaver was more important than giving grace. His own righteousness in some ways, Yaver's own righteousness got in the way of him seeing grace for what it really is. It's a tragic story. I mean, it's one of those stories that all throughout the time, you just want Yaver to get it. You just kind of want to shake him. Don't you get it? Don't you understand? It's not about keeping the law right now. Don't you get that? And he never does. It kills him. I think we get this in Luke 15 today in a lot of ways. And let me explain why. We get the beginning of the chapter in Luke 15, verses 1 and 2, where the introduction of the chapter is this. Luke writes these words, The tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to Jesus, near to him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled among themselves, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. They are frustrated. The religious, righteous people are so angry because here's Jesus living among the sinful and utterly wicked people, the prostitutes, the down and outs, the lonely, whoever it might be, and here's the religious people angry about it. They're so frustrated because because Jesus is spending his time with them. Jesus, the the religious people say, I I can't handle that. They look down on irreligious people and they say, we're better than them. We live life differently. We have standards. We want to live differently than them. But we have to keep in mind when we're reading the story that the context of this is that Jesus tells the story to the righteous people. Jesus tells this, tells this story to those who are really good at keeping the law. Jesus tells this story to the righteous people who in some ways can't get over their own righteousness. They, they can't get over how good they are in some ways. Kind of like Yaver, who can't get over the law, can't get past his own standards, and it kills him. We read today in this story, this, this amazing parable, these three stories of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost or prodigal son. You've heard that before. I could take you to any one of these stories today and talk about grace, which would be a fantastic thing. But the first two parables, I think, I want to explain quickly so we can jump into the final one. And the reason why is because in the lost sheep, what we see is the shepherd in that story leaves the 99 sheep. We just heard Gene read this. Find the one that was lost. And then Jesus says these words, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance in Luke 15, 7. He's telling this to religious people. He's telling this to the righteous people, if you will. And then the next one, the lost coin, the woman who loses her coin looks and looks for this coin. She looks everywhere for it, for the one out of ten that was lost. And when she finds it, she rejoices. And Jesus says, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents in Luke 15, 10. But I think the third story is what really gets our attention. I think the third story is what makes us stop for a minute and ponder and say, what what does this really mean? What does this say? And the way Jesus introduces it is he says, there was a man who had how many sons? Two sons. Two sons. I think sometimes we get confused and think about, is this a story of one son? This is the story of the prodigal who goes off and makes a mess of his life and then he fixes it and becomes better at the end. In other words, this is a story of a person who can self-improve their own life. 
you know. And I think a lot of times we get so confused with this because we're so focused on that one son that we miss that Jesus said this is actually a parable about, about two sons. There's two sons here that Jesus is helping us understand. And I think that's when we catch the key to the parable, when we realize this story is about two sons. First of all, there's that younger son. We all know about that guy, right? He doesn't want to have anything to do with his father anymore. He thinks life is better off without his father, in fact. He doesn't think his father can provide anything meaningful for him, fulfilling his life in any way, so he goes off on his own terms. And he says to the father, give me my inheritance. Give me what belongs to me. Read this. I wish you were dead. That's what he's saying. I can do this myself. I'm I'm good. I can handle life alone. Give me what belongs to me. I can do life on my own. I'm good with that, right? He goes to spend his entire inheritance to live however he wanted to live. And I'm not going to lie, it was probably good for a while, right? He had a lot of money at first. Things went easy. Things went great. He was the life of the party. He had all the friends at that point. Life was going smooth for a little bit. But then a national tragedy happened. Did you catch this in the text? The Bible says a famine came along. So so there's a national tragedy that happens. Life is good until everything is swept out from underneath him, and all of a sudden life is not so good anymore, right? First thing, he hits rock bottoms. We see in verse 14 through 16 that he's in need, is what the Bible tells us there. He has a lot of need. And then in verse 17, the life with his father, he realized, was actually a good life there. He realized that there were good things going on with his father. And then in verse 18 and 19, he realized he had wronged his father as well. He comes to this realization that I had done wrong to my father. And then in verse 20, he finally realizes that he needs to go back. I need to go back to the father. I could be his, I could be his hired man. I could, I mean, life's good there. I I don't have the national tragedy facing me anymore. I could go back. I could work for him. I could go back there. So we find out that he decides to go back to his father and be a laborer. I think in many ways this younger son is a little bit like Valjean in the story of Les Mis. I think that's the the character we see here. So then next in the story we read about the father in verses 20 through 24. Who is the father? Who is this guy? His father is filled with compassion when he saw his son returning. He sees his son from a distance and sees him returning and he's filled with compassion, the Bible says. He's overcome with joy. He runs to his son rather than waiting for him. He runs out there and this demonstrates this loving heart the father has for the son. And then he doesn't recount any record of wrongdoing. He forgives his son completely and says, you're mine, you're my son, I want you back. And then he wants to celebrate his son's homecoming and lavishly bless him with a party, which we read about. A beautiful party, one of the best parties we see in the Bible where the lost son has been found. That's the father. That's the description of the father we get. Then we get the picture of the older brother. This is the unique thing in the story. Where was the older brother in this? The older brother was out in the field. He was working out in the field. In other words, he was the good kid. He was the one who'd always done things right. He was the one who got the straight A's in school. He was that kid. He was the one who always followed his father's commands. He was working hard. But then think about the attitude that the Bible describes him as. In verse 28, it says, He was angry and resented his father for forgiving his brother. He's angry. And then further on, it says, He's offended by grace, forgiveness, and kindness. He's upset with the younger brother, but I think even in more reality, he's not upset at the younger brother as much as he's angry at the father. I think that's when it comes right down to it. And the reason why I know this is because he thinks his father owes him something because he's been so obedient throughout his life. He's done everything the father wants. Doesn't my dad realize that I've done everything he's ever wanted me to in verse 31? I've followed him as best I can. I've sacrificed for him. I've given to him. Doesn't dad know that about me? And it's this really interesting thing because you see this character who deals with bitterness and resentment because he can't get over the fact that he is the righteous one and his brother is the unrighteous one and his dad won't see his righteousness and say, you're amazing, son. You're awesome. You're the best, you know. He won't do that. The character, I think, in the, in the story here, this older brother, I think kind of recognize, if we could recognize him as Yaver in a lot of ways. We kind of see that character in him, always doing everything right. He can't get past his own righteousness. And in all these characters, I think the question really becomes this. What is Jesus saying about God's heart towards people 
and the right way for people to relate to God? What, what, is, what does that look like? I think that's the question we need to wrestle with in this. If, if parables don't necessarily have one direct meaning, I think the bigger question is, what is Jesus telling us about God's heart towards people and how people should relate to the Lord? And I think in these characters, we see about three ways to live in this, is what we see. Now, now don't forget, I, I want to say this again, the context of this whole thing is that Jesus is welcoming sinners to eat with him right? This irritated the religious people so much. And so he tells this story to the religious people. He gives them the clue that this is for them. So I think these characters, when he explains them, I I think he's telling these people that there are really three ways to live in this. And I think he's saying, number one, you can live an irreligion-centered life. You can live completely waywardly. You can. It's not a good idea, but you can. Jesus is saying that. You can live that way, exemplified by the younger brother. He's saying the second way you can live, you can live the religious-centered life. You can live righteously and do everything you possibly can to do the right thing all of the time. You can live religiously, exemplified by the older brother, the one who did everything right. And finally, I think Jesus is also going to show us that you can live a gospel-centered life, where Jesus wants to get our hearts there and help us to see the tension that we need to live in, where we don't want to live like the younger brother, And we don't want to have an attitude like the older brother. And I think that's what Jesus wants to get us to. So let me explain these things real quick. If you give me a few minutes here to explain these, I think it will help you understand your heart and help you understand how to relate better to God today. Because I think you fit in one of these, whether you know it or not. So first of all, the irreligious life. Uh, The irreligion is living about whatever makes you happy. Your religion. Live however you want to, whatever you do to make you happy. This is called hedonism, right? You've heard it probably called hedonism. Do whatever it is to make you happy. That's your win. That's the best thing you can possibly do. And most people do this to some level, right? I mean, we all do. I do things to make me happy. I mean, I get that. I fly fish. I do some of these hobbies, things to make me happy. You know, that's part of my life. But, but there are things that you do to make you happy as well. But the difference is, is that irreligious people tend to always live that that way. They do everything they can about themselves. And so even though a hedonist acknowledges God, maybe, there's a sense that, that, he, that this person gets personal happiness no matter what the cost is. It's kind of the American way, right? The American dream, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? But we get that. Like, we understand that. We're Americans. We, we understand that, you know. So irreligion is about living for whatever makes you happy. A second thing about irreligion, I think it denies the fact that we're all sinners, I think that's one of the unique things about this passage is that Jesus is saying it denies this fact that there are sinful people, that we are all sinful people. And on the surface, these people seem to think that everyone can do whatever is right for themselves. They believe that everyone can determine what is right and wrong for themselves. And they're not convinced that God will punish any sin. Now, if you contrast this with the Bible, in Romans 3.23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So there's a contrast to the irreligious life and what the Bible says. Many times I think uh, irreligious people think that the only attribute of God is love. Have you run into people like this? That the only thing God could possibly be is love? Like he loves me no matter what I do. and, And that's the biggest operating thing that a person who's irreligious thinks. Well, God won't judge me because he loves me. I can do whatever I want to do and he loves me. He will love me no matter what and that's the thing. And I think that's the idea is that, you know, some people have the same attitude as Voltaire who famously on his deathbed said, of course God forgives me. That's his job, right? That's what people think who are irreligious think of God. God's job is simply to forgive, to be in heaven, to be benevolent towards all people and whatever decision they possibly make, right? But there's a contrast in the story. Jesus is not telling people to live like that. That's the thing. Jesus is not saying irreligion is a good way to live. He's contrasting it, saying that's not the way to live. Irreligious people sometimes are even, this is a shocker, sometimes even involved in church. Not kidding you, right? There's irreligious people at church. And we should welcome them, just like Jesus, right? We should be people who welcome the irreligious people and say, you're welcome to be part of us. You're welcome to question the text. You're welcome to wrestle with it. You're welcome to yell, you know, if you want to. It'd be awkward, but you're welcome to, you know. We want you to be here. We want you to wrestle with things that the Bible say. 
I trust the Bible's true and I trust it's powerful. I trust it much more than I trust my own words. So I trust if you're looking into this thing and you consider yourself irreligious today, you'll find Jesus. You'll find him. I believe that. But the reality is I think there are irreligious people in the churches. And the reason why is because there are even more liberal churches that have kind of irreligious people in them. They kind of live however they want to and do whatever they want to. And and there's not going to be anyone who confronts their way of living and says, that's not right. That's wrong. You know, and that's the unique thing about the job of, of the pastor, the job of your, of your generosity group to, to come alongside you and to say that's not the right way of living. That's the job of your friends, your brothers and sisters in Christ who will be willing to say that's not right. That's not the right way to live. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so there are irreligious people everywhere. I believe it. The church isn't just for the righteous religious people, all right? Know that. We're filled with sinful people, and we're filled with people who are trying to be like Christ. That's the reality. Irreligion also operates on the principle of this. What is the least common denominator to get into heaven? Right? What's the last thing? I can, if I can live however I want to, what's the least common thing I have to do? And many times the lowest common denominator is this. It's that idea of being true to yourself. You know, as long as you're faithful in what you believe, you'll be set. You'll, you'll be good, you know, it'll be awesome. And that's, that's an irreligious way of living because what you're basically saying is that you are king, queen, and prime minister over things that are right and wrong. If you just say, I can live however I want to be as long as I'm pathetic, then I'll be fine. God will accept me for who I am, you know. And that's the reality is that's, that's irreligion because you're, you're saying, I'm just going to believe whatever I believe about myself. And I'm going to live however I want to. It operates on that principle of saying, I just, I just think whatever I think is going to be right. And that's the way it goes. No one is wrong. And, and this is the funny thing. As long as I'm not the worst person in the room, I'll be fine, right? We've run into people like that. I, I, I know I've run into people like that who, who believe, you know, as long as, as, long as you, if, if God's graded on, the, graded on a curve and you're a little above the curve, you'll be all right, you know? I'm not Hitler, I'm not the pedophile, I'm not that person, so I'm set, you know, I'll be fine. That's, that's what judgment of God is redeemed, that's, that's what that's for, for those really, really bad people. And irreligion tends to operate on that principle. But there's a contrast in this in Titus chapter two where it says the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. That's the contrast to that. Your religion is a contrast to what the Bible is telling us. So don't think that the Bible is telling us to operate our lives in that way. You may be in that camp today. The Bible would encourage you to move somewhere else. So that's first. The second thing is the religious life. And this is represented well by the older son we read in Luke chapter 15. Or I think even Yahweh uh, exemplifies the religious life. Think about the older son here. He's the son who'd done everything right, as we said. He's the poster boy that all parents would be proud of, right? He's the varsity sport one. He's that guy. And most of us would probably think, I'd want that guy as my son. If I had a choice, I'd choose the older brother, all right? I would. I understand that. I think most of us would say, we want that guy. But I think this son may he even have more to tell us about the heart of God than the younger son's response, I think. And I think this is where the heart of the matter comes in today. We read in Luke 15, 28 through 32, but the younger son was angry and refused to go into the party. The younger son was angry, and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. Look, his father went after him and said, would you come to the party? And, and he answered his father again, look, these many years I've served you. I've never disobeyed your commands. You never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said, you're, and the father said to the son, son, you're always with me. All that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this brother of yours was dead. He's now alive. He was lost, but now he's found. What do we see about the younger or the older son here? The key here is that he refused to go to the party. The, the father wanted him to come to the party. The father wanted to invite him to this, this party where he celebrated the foundness of his younger son. The father went out and treated him and said, come. But the interesting thing is, this older brother, his good works, his righteousness actually got in the way 
of him attending the party. His, his righteousness became a roadblock for him to see who God, or God is represented as the Father in this, to get to that point where he sees who God really is and the heart of the Father. And the interesting thing is, I think that happens many times in our lives. It happened to Yahweh. His righteousness got in the way of him seeing anything good out there. And many times our righteous deeds can get in the way of us seeing God for, he, for who he really is. Many people think this entire story is about actually entering the kingdom of God. And if that's the case, then his good deeds actually kept him from attending the feast. That's weird, right? If you're thinking about this, we, we think about Christianity as about being self-improved and helping ourselves and, and becoming sanctified. If you've been in church, you know that cool word, and it is. That's part of that. But many times our own personal striving for sanctification can help us or hinder us from missing the grace of God many times, if we're not careful. If we're not careful to see that our own hearts aren't just working hard so that we'll gain God's approval, if we don't see that that's not what we're doing it for, but we're doing it in response for God's love and what he's done for us, if we don't do that, we may have our righteous deeds get in the way of us seeing God for who he really is. If we strive hard for our approval to come from the Lord based on the things we do, it can be a tragedy. It can be a tragedy for us. The religious life is characterized by these things. Religion is about self-righteousness and self-justification, I would say. We usually try to make ourselves acceptable to God in some way. We say, if I can just try hard enough, God will accept me. He'll let me in. He'll love me. That's the religious-centered life. Usually this happens in one of three ways. Either by doing good deeds, avoiding bad deeds, or knowing the right things. Those are the things that we tend to think of when we think about religious-centered life. If we just do the right things, we'll be set. Or if we just avoid the bad things, we'll be fine. Or if I know the right things about theology, right? Like, I have the corner on the market on theology, I'm set. You know, as long as that's the case, then, then I'm good. And it becomes about self-righteousness and self-justification. We figure if we're good enough, God will be forced to accept us. He'll look down from heaven and say, that, that guy, that guy's amazing. Have you seen that guy? I mean, he prays for six hours every morning. He fasts twice a week. He gives to the poor. That guy's amazing. Can you, can you imagine God doing that? <laughs> Grabbing an angel. Hey, Michelangelo, come here. <laughs> come here. Got to see this. This person is amazing. I can't see that happening. I just can't see God doing that. I, I, I see that God levels the playing field for us as his people. And, and righteous deeds are for us to respond to God's goodness and to walk in sanctification because he saved us so that we don't live irreligiously. We live in a way that's righteous before the Lord, but because we're not trying to justify ourselves or make ourselves righteous before the Lord. The way we live says we must obey the truth in order to be saved. While the principle of obedience is good, it can be done for all the wrong reasons, I believe. And that's what we have to be careful of, especially for those who've been in church for a long time. If we're looking for that higher level sanctification, if we say, I'm going to try harder now so I have another level of spirituality, that's what we have to be careful to guard our hearts from. Second, religion relies on obedience to a set of morals to be accepted. This idea of moralism is the basic belief that we're accepted by our good behavior and good works. Now, it's important to understand, just as irreligious people can be in the church, religious people do not have to be church people. They don't have to be church people. In fact, many times they are, but many times moralists are simply conservative. Many times moralists may just be, you know, either they're, they're philosophically or politically conservative, and they become moralists who have righteousness in that way. And if moralistic people are deeply religious, the truth of the matter is there's usually no transforming joy or power in their spiritual life. If there's this deeply religious sense in moralism, there's no joy in following Jesus. It just becomes about following the rules and doing everything you can to make yourself righteous. And interestingly, interestingly these people who tend towards religion, centered living, or moralism struggle with a couple things, and I've seen this in my life, where they struggle with A, either self-hatred, or B, self-inflation or they hate themselves because they can't live up to the standards. I had a friend who I went to grad school with who really, really struggled with sin in his life. And he was a good friend of mine. I knew what he was going through. And he was always, always 
just doubting himself, just feeling rotten, feeling self-hatred. And it was, a, it was something that he'd seen minor victories over in his life at various times throughout his life, but he kept kind of falling back under it. And the guy dealt with so much self-hatred. Instead of actually getting to the heart of the matter where he wanted to love Jesus more than hate the sin at that point, he became a guy that was so trying to manage his sin that it drove him crazy. He spent time as a counselor. His marriage almost dissolved. It was really rough to watch. He was a really good friend of mine. It was all because he had so much self-hatred because he couldn't live up to the righteous standards that he had placed upon himself. It was, it was tragic. The other type of people are maybe self-inflated where they think they live up to the standards. I went to a conservative Bible college. It was amazing. And it was hilarious to watch the jockeying for position in the conservative Bible college the amount of spiritual disciplines that got thrown out there and the goodness that w- was among there, you know. Was, and everyone just thought that. I mean, it was, even when I got there, we, we still, the men still had to wear collared shirts and tuck their shirts in. I've very much rebelled against that now, so it's a good thing. I'm trying to get away from religion in my life. All right, so that's a good thing. But it's, it's one of those things that we had, to, we had to go there, and everyone looked good, and they had this sense of being good kids. And what happened in that is, is it made a bunch of little Pharisees in many, many ways. And I felt myself getting there. And I, if I wasn't careful, I forgot that I was a sinner in desperate need of grace, in desperate need of God's saving touch in my life. And so I had to be so careful to guard my heart for that. Religious people also tend to live their lives in either fear or unmet expectations as well. Their motivation for following the Lord is, is based on what happens if they don't obey. People will go to church because they think if, if they don't go to church that God's going to punish them in some way. You won't get the parking spot in front of the, the restaurant after lunch or for lunch or something. Or, you know, if you have some weird beliefs about the way God works, if you, if you don't pray enough about something, God will, will punish you for that or spite you for that or won't allow you to do the things that you want to do. That, that religious spirit needs to be torn from us. And I think God wants to in many ways. It's a horrible way to live, to live in fear about whether we're being righteous enough before the Lord. Let me just set you free today. Your righteousness doesn't come from your good deeds. You get that? Your righteousness never comes from your good deeds. It comes from Christ. Christ. He gives us our righteousness, and we respond in good deeds because of that. That's why we do those things. That's why we live according to what the Bible says because we respond to Jesus and what he has done. So let me just set you free this morning. The church isn't about just making you a good person. The church is about making dead people come alive is what it's about. Because when you come alive, your life will come together and you will go, I want to live in response to what Jesus has done for me. And that's a beautiful thing. Don't feel like your righteousness has to come by how good you do or how accepted you feel. That's not where your righteousness comes from. The Bible talks about our righteousness coming from from Christ. To wrap this up, I think that both religious and irreligious people have a lot in common, to be honest with you. I think the reality is that they both have the same root issue. They seem so different, but in reality, they're both the same. Because I think the reality is they both live in a way that tries to avoid Jesus as the Savior and Lord, and they aspire to control their own lives. Whether that's an irreligious person living for happiness however they want to, whether that's a religious person trying so hard to live self-righteously to gain that acceptance so Jesus doesn't have to be the Savior because you can do it on your own, I think they're the same root issues there. They are both based on distorted views of a real God, of who God really is. For irreligious people, they reject that they've offended a holy God. The Bible talks about how God is holy. They reject that there's God has a law that we are to follow and are required to follow. That, that the religious people out there, they reject that God is completely loving and wants a relationship with all people. He is so holy and pure and kind of out there that I cannot be convinced that grace is available to everyone. It's the difference in the religious and irreligious. They're both the same root Thing. And then finally, number three, they deny the power, they deny sin and lose the joy and incredible power of grace, I think as well, is what happens. Irreligious people say the message of Jesus' death on the cross as a substitute for my sins has no power over me. Religious people say I'm only sorry for my sins because I haven't lived up the high standards that I have for myself. I, I have these high standards and if I sin, I'm bummed out because I haven't lived according to the way I want to. 
It's denying the sin and losing the joy and incredible power of what grace is. So I think the third way and the final way with how I close today's message is that there is a third way to live. It's called the gospel-centered life. And I think the gospel is this. I don't think it's we go from being irreligious to religious. And I think that's where people get confused. I think many times people come into church and think, oh, I'm just moving from irreligion to religion. I'm moving from younger brother to older brother. But that, that's not it. But it's the reason, it's the moment that we realize that both our religiosity and our irreligiosity are both essentially the same thing and they're both essentially wrong. We turn to the gospel, which is different, and it's all about God's grace. I'm very indebted to Dr. Tim Keller and his book, The Prodigal God, for this next part of my, my message here. If you haven't read that book, I would highly encourage you to read this, but he revolutionized the end of this parable for me and helped me realize something. He says these words. In Luke 15, Jesus told his listeners these three parables together. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And he did this for a reason. And he shares this story. He says, in each of the first two parables, there is a lost object that someone goes out to find it. Someone goes out to venture to get it. Whether it's the shepherd who goes to find the lost sheep or the woman who tries to find her lost coin, there's someone pursuing. But then here in the third parable, to our surprise, no one goes out and seeks out the lost son. No one does that job. And if if Jesus told these all together, I think the ancient hearer would have thought to themselves, where's the person who's supposed to go pursue that lost thing? Where did that come from? And I think the answer would have been quite clear, according to Keller, about the first century reader and listener, is that it should have been the elder brother. It should have been the elder brother who decided to go seek out the lost son, the prodigal, the younger brother. After all, in that culture, the elder brother was the one who had the mantle of authority over the household in that. And they were the one who were given the responsibility of taking care of the house and making sure everything was okay. And so what happens here in the story is the elder brother decides not to go out and help. He stays back, continues to live for his own righteousness, his own good deeds. And the elder brother doesn't do what we would expect him to do. It's the elder brother in the parable who said something like this. My father, my, older, my younger brother's been a fool. I don't want to be anywhere near that guy. And now his life is in ruins. And he should have said this. I'll go find him. I'll go grab him and I'll bring him home. I'll bring him back here and, and help him to understand what Jesus, what the father offers him, in other words. And so the other brother doesn't do this. The, he, Jesus doesn't put an elder brother like that in the story. Instead, the story is of the younger son, the father, who has to deal with the resistant self-righteousness of the elder brother. But here's the thing. We don't have to do that today. And the reason why is because the elder brother in the story makes us long for a true elder brother who would be the one to go out and seek us and find us. The kind of elder brother that we would need. Think of that elder brother who we would need. We need the one who wouldn't just go to a far country, but would come all the way from heaven to earth for us. We don't need the elder brother who would just open his wallet for us. We need the one who would pour out his life for us as his people. We need one who would pay the infinite cost of his life for us as his people. And we have that other brother. The reality is that elder brother, I think, is Jesus Christ. I think it's the one who is missing in the story. The third way, the elder brother who would reach out to save us, to bring us into relationship with God again. When the father says to the elder brother, everything I have is yours, that is literally true from what God said to Jesus, right? He had equal glory with the father, but he emptied himself. In Philippians 2, the Bible tells us, where he lost everything for us as his people. How do we get the father's robe? You remember the father gave his robe to his younger son? How do we get that? Because Jesus was stripped naked on the cross. He was one who, who took the wrath of God upon himself to give us joy, to give us a clothing made of righteousness that I mentioned a minute ago, to place upon us righteousness as opposed to the deeds, whether irreligious or religious deeds that we do, he gave those to us as the true elder brother. So Jesus, as the Bible says, is not afraid or not ashamed to call us his brothers, is what the Bible tells us. It's a beautiful thought. He says, I will declare your name, my brothers, in Hebrews. What a great thought. Jesus came to earth and fully obeyed the Father instead of doing whatever he wanted to do. And that's, that's the beauty 
That's the beauty of the gospel today. In the gospel, the gospel-centered life says that salvation is made because an elder brother came for us to save us, to give us life. And in loving response, we live out the fact that the gospel has made us a new person. In the gospel, we realize about ourselves that I am more sinful than I have ever dared to believe, but I am more accepted and loved than I have ever dreamed or hoped. That's the reality. In the gospel, we realize that. You can admit that. I'm more sinful than I ever thought I was, but I'm more accepted and loved than I ever hoped to be. What a beautiful thought, right? That's the gospel. And that's the third way. That's the way that says you don't have to live for God's acceptance because he can accept you through Christ. That's the beauty of Luke 15. If your religion rejects God, religion uses God, but the gospel trusts God. That's the reality of it today. And in some ways, I would encourage you today in closing to turn your life over to the elder brother, to the right elder brother, the one who wants to bring you back wherever you're at, whether you're, and if you're remembering, this was told to the religious people, so if you're If you're in that camp today, Jesus can save you. If you're in the wayward camp, the person who says, I'm living life however I want, I get the hedonism thing. That's what I do. That's my life. I'm making whatever makes me happy, you know. If you're in that camp, Jesus can save you as well. The gospel says everyone can receive mercy and grace at the foot of the cross, where we receive that from God. And and the way we do this is simple this morning. If you don't know how to do this this morning, I want to give you two easy ways to do this. Number one, You say to the Lord, I want to repent, which means I want to turn from the way I was living. Whether that's your repenting of your righteous deeds to make yourself acceptable or your unrighteous deeds that are making you a hedonist, you want to repent of those things and turn towards the gospel and say, I want to be filled with Christ's righteousness. I want him to do that for me so that I can walk in holiness and walk in sanctification next. You repent. That's the thing the Bible tells us to do. And secondly, you have faith. You believe. You believe that God can do that for you. You believe that this message just doesn't sound good, but it's true, right? This is true this morning. I believe it 100%. I believe that you can be made a new person today in here, that you can walk out of here holding on, instead of holding on to the garbage that you walked in with, whether that was you're trying to make yourself acceptable or whether that's your mess of your life, you can release that to the Lord this morning and say, I, I need a true elder brother that came from a far country to save me. I need him to touch my life, to draw me back to the Father again. I need that. You can turn to the true elder brother in Jesus Christ this morning. That's a picture of repentance. That picture in the younger son who turns back to his father and and comes before him in humility and says, I I need you. I'll just work. I'll I'll just, I just need you. That's it. I just need you. And that's the picture of repentance today. And unfortunately, we don't see repentance in the older son. It's what's missing in the story. So, don't be a Yaver. Don't be too good to reform, all right? Don't be a Valjean, at least the early days of Valjean, where you live however you want to live. Know that there's a God who's given us a third way to give us life, to make us new, and to help us respond to Jesus. And that's a great thing this morning. Would you pray with me about these things? God, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that we can be brought before you by the true elder brother. Lord, I'm thankful today that we don't have to be people that are self-righteous. We don't have to be people that are trying hard to gain our acceptance because our acceptance comes through Christ. I would pray this morning, no matter where people are at in here, that they would feel compelled by the grace of God this morning. And this, and this story of lostness would touch them, whether they're, they find themselves to be a more religious person in here today or whether they find themselves to be an irreligious person in here today. Lord, I pray that you would help reform our hearts by the truth of the gospel and not just by our good works, Lord. I pray that you'd set us free as your people. I pray, Lord, that we would be... Um, confronted with this and excited about what you can do to draw us to yourself. And Lord, I I pray most of all that your spirit would touch people's hearts in here. God, this this word is for me. I I feel it. I feel this as I've, in my Christian walk, I, I see older brother characteristics in me at times and I want to repent of those. I want to walk away from those. Lord, I see younger brother characteristics in me at times and I want to walk away from those as well. So help me to turn to the true elder brother. 
that gives me life, that wants to draw me to the Father. And I pray that would happen now in Jesus' name. Amen.